which uh, I would highly recommend if you want to learn what words mean. Get you a book on etymology. That means the study of the origin of words. Find out what the root words mean. Find out what the prefixes and the suffixes and all that mean, because it really helps you know what's being said. But anyway, the word constitution, the root word of constitution is the root word stit, or it's, it's stit, stat. Depending on how it's used, they would change the vowel be so it's easy to pronounce. So it, it's where we get the word stand, um, statue, uh, statutes, are very similar. Statutes are laws that stand, have standing. Uh, of course, in the de facto, almost nothing has standing anymore because it's all illegitimate. Um, but anyway, that's what the root word means. And so con means together with, and so it means things that stand together. So when you're going to constitute a government, you need to decide what's going to stand together. Um, if a law is not good, it has no standing. I mean, if a law is not constitutional, that means it doesn't stand together with the rest. So you throw it out. That's why the Supreme Court ruled that any law that is repugnant to the Constitution, or any law that's vague, for, no, any law that's repugnant to the Constitution is null and void from its inception. And it should be treated as if it never were a law, because it's not allowed to stand with the things that do stand. It has no standing. So. Uh, that's what the Constitution means. So the Constitution, the body, is is things that that that, that stand that we're going to stand up our government with. Um, if a government doesn't have any standing, it can't govern. See? So we, the people, created or ordained the Constitution. We decided what's going to stand and what doesn't stand. Now, unfortunately, if you're going to do that, you got to be able to back it up. See. Um, and that's the problem we have here in America, is that people aren't able or willing to stand for a great many things. Uh, let me ask you something. If some, let me ask this question. If someone invades your property, what are you going to do about it? What if you, you say, please get off my property and say, I don't want to. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> See, nowadays we live in such a litigious society, you're afraid to do anything because you're afraid, well, if I hurt him, I might go to jail myself. And the reason is because we've gotten to the, to the point where nothing stands anymore. Anyway, I'm getting a little sidetracked there, but it's so important that as we look through this, as we go through this, we gotta we gotta decide whether we're gonna be people who stand up or not. See? And what's what's one of the goals, by the way, I'll sidetrack again, I like to get sidetracked. <laughs> one of the goals of the de facto government and those that are controlling it, uh, the big the, the big uh, world elitists and so forth, the globalists. One of their goals is to create a people or to manipulate a people where they don't stand for anything. That's one of the reasons why they put fluoride in our water. That's one of the reasons they put, have chemtrails going through. And that's the reason they have all kinds of things. Our public school education is all about dumbing us down, getting us where we don't stand for anything. The man who won't stand for anything will fall for anything. And they want you to fall for everything they throw out. And uh, so anyway, it's very important to understand the meanings of these words. So uh, the preamble is that which walks before that comes before the things are, that, that we're going to take our stand on, and that we're going to require government to stand on. And uh, so, just in my review, uh, the preamble starts off: "We the people, we the people." So we're going to talk about that a little bit. I, I, I finished off of that last week, and uh, I just want to point out again, for, as a review, that they did not say "We the United States." <coughs> they said "We the people." So this tells us that power emanates from the people. It doesn't emanate from the states. It emanates from the people. Um, I'm going to review everything, but that's just one thing. And the other reason they did that is because they had no way of whether the states were going to ratify the Constitution. So they couldn't say we the states. So anyway, now the third thing I want to talk about, I'll spend most of the time talking about, is the question, who are we the people? You can scroll down a little bit. Who are we the people? In fact, you fill that whole screen there with that would be good. All right. It's very important for us to know who we are to learn our history. And that's another thing our government's been successful at doing in our public schools. History has been so watered down and things taken out and not taught that should have been taught along all along that we've lost that. We don't even know who we are. If people don't know who they are, they sure cannot stand on something that, that their forefathers determined they should stand for. If you forget where you are, if you don't know that you own property, if you're not sure, 
Like how many people have, have, now are they, you hear, oh, we don't really own our property. We don't really own our cars. The government does, and we just, we're just tenants on the land. Well, once they get you to believe that, then you don't act like somebody who owns property. You act like a tenant, and then you don't care, see? So though they, they say that, it's a de facto government saying that. So if I own property, if I think I own property, I'm going to know I own property. And I don't care what they say. If they say I don't, I'm going to disagree. And I'm going to stand for it, see? Because I am learning how to stand. And that's what we've got to get back, back to. So anyway, let me give you a little bit of history that, uh, about who the people were that founded this country. Um, the people who came to America in the early, early days, they did so largely to escape religious persecution in England and other countries. Now, I'm going to give you some analogies from the Bible because it, does, it just goes so well. Just like God brought his people, I got some background music, music from Egypt, it sounds like. <laughs> uh, just as one. God brought his people, I'm going to use his people in quotes because that's we have to, we the people. Just like God brought his people out of the persecution they endured in Egypt, way back, the Bible talks about this in, in Exodus, uh, and it gave them the, the, he gave them the land of Canaan, which later became known as the land of Israel. Just like God did that, God was working in various means to provide his New Testament people um, a land where they can serve him in peace and liberty with prosperity. <coughs> also, just as a, and, and so, just as a mixed multitude, if you know the Bible at all, just as a mixed multitude uh, came out of Egypt with the Israelites, a mixed multitude of people has come to America also. But uh, there's a clear understanding, a clear picture of what God was doing. When you look at the writings of our founding fathers, the things that they said, the things that they wrote, the record they left, and the way they went about doing so. One of the things I wanted to do, and I, I forgot to, I will, uh, I'm not going to ask Brad to do anything on the computer, unless you can find it quick. Do you think you can go to Amazon.com and bring up, up Plymouth Plantation? I think they'll allow you to read the front page, What's the first page, of Plymouth, Plymouth, of Plymouth Plantation. This is a book written by uh, uh, Governor Bradford, uh, Bradbury, is that right? No, that's not, Bradford, I think. Governor Bradford, uh, the governor of um, Plymouth Colony, and no, governor of, um, yeah, I think that's right. And anyway, he wrote a history of, of, of Plymouth Colony, called Of Plymouth Plantation. And the first page is very, very interesting. Uh, the whole book is interesting. I've got the book. I highly recommend you get it and read it. It's quite a read. It's uh, you got to labor through because they write. They wrote old-fashioned way of writing. But uh, I tell you, when you, you want to exercise your mind, just do that, and you'll find that they say a lot in few words. And that's why I love to write to read the writings of our founding fathers. They are such so much intelligent, so much more intelligent than we are. We think, we, we, this is the way we talk. You know, like, um, well, uh, yeah, um, uh, <laughs> we say so many unnecessary words, and I'm guilty myself. And uh, we say things that don't have much meaning unless you know the code. Uh, but anyway, I would recommend you get that. Have you able to find that yet? Second. Yeah, almost. Your second. Uh, that one that you just clicked on, that's what I got. And usually it allows you to, yeah, click to look inside. And sometimes they let us see a page. Uh, that's what I did. In fact, I bought mine off uh, Amazon. For, yeah, before you had to say, look inside. Um, and it didn't do anything? You clicked on it? You click on the image. You go back to the... Oh, search inside this book. Yeah. Just thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's busy. But anyway, um, it's an apple, yeah. I sure they're better. Um, I need to put my glass on if I'm going to read that anyway. So. Yeah, no, I won't. it's just plain blurry. So uh, now, uh, so the Plymouth, uh, the pilgrims that landed at Plymouth Rock, they came here seeking freedom to worship God as they believe they ought to based on their study of the scriptures without being held uh, you know, hauled off into court and uh, being held for trial and then tortured or put to death because they refused to go along with, the, with some established religion. 
See, a lot of people don't understand that in England, uh, what's that? Okay. If you can find, if you have, that's it, that's all they love. Oh, here you go. Yeah, scroll up to the first page. It's loading. And uh, that's the table of contents. Yeah, that's a very good book. Um, that's the preface. You just keep going to the front. Uh, I don't know how long the prep. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that's it. Chapter one. I mean, it's starting under under the heading chapter one. Uh, and under after the heading it says, first I will unfold the causes that led to the foundation of the New Plymouth Settlement, and the motives of those concerned in it. In order that I may give an accurate account of the project, I must begin at the very root and rise of it. And this I, I shall endeavor to do in a plain style and with singular regard to the truth, at least as near as my slender judgment can attain to it. As is well known, ever since the breaking out of the light of the gospel in England, which was the first country to be thus enlightened after the gross darkness of popery had overspread the Christian world, Satan has maintained various wars against the saints from time to time in different ways, sometimes by bloody death and cruel torment, at other times by imprisonment, banishment, and other wrongs, as if loath that his kingdom should be overcome, the truth prevail, and the church of God revert to their ancient purity. Now, that's on the front page. I mean, he's saying, we came here to get away from the control of the Catholic Church, which had pretty much had control of all the civilized world. And and it, as is here, he clearly states, we want to get back to the ancient purity, but the devil's going to fight us. He's been fighting us. So, now, I'm not <coughs> saying this to bash Catholicism. I love Catholic people. I do. But a lot of people do not know the roots of things and what and how the religion and organized religion has a tendency to get control of people. I don't care what it is. You just name any organized religion. I'll guarantee you, if given the liberty to, they'll soon try to control people. And... Uh, so, uh, by the way, I'm one of those guys, I don't mind people that don't like organized religion. I don't blame you at all. <laughs> There's such a history of them uh, corrupting people's minds and, 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 uh, and, and uh, uh, what's the word, trampling their rights and so forth and trying to cram their uh, doctrine down. And some people may think I'm doing that now. I'm not. I'm just giving you a little bit of history. And uh, you can take it or leave it. Uh, I didn't write that book. He did. <laughs> But anyway, so, but I want to point, I want to point out something. Uh, look at that second paragraph. As is well known ever since the breaking out of the light of the gospel in England. That phrase here is based on the fact that you've got to understand your timetable. For years during the, during the rise of the Catholic Church, and, and when it became known as Catholic and universal and pretty much secured as control, it was around 680, 610, I think. Some people argue about that, but I'm not going to argue about that. But, uh, but they pretty much had universal control over the civilized world at that time, Europe mainly. And uh, so up until the year about, oh, 1400, late 1400s, early 1500s. Now, anybody know what happened in, I think, 1496? Uh, some big, big event that happened that sparked. It was, the, it was sort of the, the, the flinch, you might say, that sparked the Reformation. There's something that happened in Germany. I'm not talking about Martin Luther either. Before that, that was 1500s. Anybody know? I'm just curious. You might know where I'm going. Martin Luther? Huh? No, before Luther. Before that, yeah. Very important is the invention of the movable type printing press. Yes. The first thing printed was a Bible, the Gutenberg Bible. Now, that that caught, allowed for massive copies to be made, well, massive compared to what they were before, people would make copies by hand. Um, now, so that allowed the Bible to get out to more people. Pretty soon, there was all more printers. You know, so with this invention, and then the, the Bible being out pretty soon, you just, you just look, study history. How many inventions were there other than for, you know, warfare, tearing down a castle, and you know, these, uh, what do you call this, catapults and so forth. And, and the, the, the rams and so forth, other than the weapons of warfare, what kind of inventions were being done for those, you know, 1,200 years, uh, between, say, 300 and, and, and 1,500? Not very many. 
So, but with with the uh, printing of the Bible and it becoming available, and bear in mind that uh, this is another fact uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the under the regime of the Catholic uh, Church um, over Europe, they, people were not allowed to have their own Bibles, only the priests, because they said only the church, only the people. Uh, we're the only ones that can understand it. That's why, for example, everything was done in Latin and and, and so forth, and even even today, many uh, things are still done in Latin. But as people began, as the Bible got printed, people began to have Bibles um, that people began reading. Wait a minute, why are we doing this? The Bible says this. And so that's what led to this light um, that's been distinguished. <laughs> uh, this light is referring to the gospel became well known throughout England. And uh, so then you have different people like uh, Martin Luther was a Catholic priest who one day was reading his Bible, came across a phrase, the just shall live by faith. He said, what am I doing? I'm punishing myself and fasting and beating myself and doing things to, to tell God I'm sorry when I can just live by faith. And, and many others, I won't go through the whole Reformation history. But what was happening, God was doing something. He's preparing people and he's preparing a land and a place where those people could get refuge. So, uh, so I'll give you a couple stories. Um, after the breakup of the control of Catholicism by Henry VIII, uh, Henry VIII was, was a big mover and shaker in that, in that he wanted a divorce, he couldn't have a son by his wife, so he asked the Pope to grant him a divorce. The Pope refused. So the king said, well, he's king. He said, I'll do what I want to do. I'll start my own church. So he started the Church of England. <laughs> and uh, he became the head of the Church of England. And uh, so that, that was another thing that God used to help break down the dam and break down the controls. And pretty soon you had other people, Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli and John Huss and John Knox and many other people, all <coughs> formerly Catholics who were waking up as they're reading their Bibles and realizing something's not right here. And so they start all these different denominations. Lutherans got started by Martin Luther. Ulrich Zwingli was founder of some independent people who Later on, uh, he influenced the, the, the start of uh, a man named Menno Simmons, who started the Mennonites, and, and uh, John, John and Charles Wesley started the Methodists, and John Knox was very instrumental, he and John Calvin, instrumental in the start of Calvinism, and so forth. Anyway, all this, is, I'm just giving you a little bit of history of, of the religious uh, environment there. But when you have, when you, in England, when you had a king or queen who was, say, Catholic, that they'd want to get it, the nation back to being Catholic. When you had a Protestant, they wanted to get it free from that. And, and, and what happened? They were persecuting each other. And uh, so people were trying to get away. The pilgrims, for example, they came seeking freedom to worship uh, as they believed they, uh, according to the dictates of their own conscience, without being held to trial for it. And uh, so, by the way, the, on that same time frame, uh, 1620s when the pilgrims came, well, just a few years before, the King James Bible had been uh, translated, retranslated. King James, he had nothing to do with it except he made a proclamation. Because at that time, he had these different competing groups that were all wanting the Bible translated, you know, themselves. And so you had the Great Bible, you had the Matthew Bible, the Coverdale Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and Geneva Bible. Those were the five main ones. And so the king said, you know, we need one, we're all English speaking people, we need one. Let's redo a translation, get the best scholars and so forth. So they did. And uh, they created a very, very intricate uh, system to checks and balances, to, to get all the extant manuscripts and so forth, and create a new translation, which resulted in what became commonly known as the King James Bible, or uh, otherwise called the Authorized Bible. And uh, so that was done in 1611. So now, after that, um, uh, let's see, I'm kind of going back and forth here. But there, uh, I want to tell you a very, very important story to give you an understanding of the kind of people here. We had all kinds of people, all these different denominations now, um, the, the, uh, Protestants mostly, but of course Catholics came too. And that's why Maryland is called Maryland. And uh, they, they found a, uh, they, they, they kind of gathered together there. And uh, some of the, many of the colonies, for example, once they got set up, they required the people to they tax the people and have what's called a clergy tax. So if, so if one colony is Congregationalist, and because they did come, and usually in churches, uh, the pilgrims came, they had a, a leader. And, uh, and another one I'll tell you about in a little bit, many of them came as churches. 
church, a whole church would, would, uh, would migrate or immigrate and come to America and set up their colonies and live according to what they believe in. And then you have all these different colonies that began to intermingle with each other and trade with each other. And so then states were formed. And, and uh, so, uh, but one of, the, one of the groups that came, uh, one of the groups that was being persecuted, regardless of whether it was a Catholic or Protestant in England, were the Baptists. Everybody hated the Baptists because for, for many reasons. Number one, they were very stubborn. <laughs> they believed what they believed and they wouldn't compromise. And number two, they did not accept infant baptism and so that made all the other groups that were baptized by infants mad because, hey, what do you mean? My baptism when I was a baby isn't any good, you know? And uh, so they, so everybody hated the Baptists. So they had to leave England because the persecution was too hot, and they went to Holland. But then pretty soon, the folks in Holland found out how how stubborn they were in their beliefs, and they didn't like their, like say, some a teenager gets uh, converted. And, uh, and starts going to Baptist church. His parents belong to some other, say, some Reformed church or something. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. They'd get upset when their teenage son says, Mom, I got baptized today. <laughs> and so, what? What's going on? And so, anyway, the Baptists, everybody got mad at the Baptists. So they had to leave Holland, and they came to America and settled here. Now, and so they went about doing that. They had freedom, except when they'd go to some counties or some colonies, uh, they were not given freedom because they were required to pay a tax to support the state religion. And they would refuse because they said, I'm not going to give my money to support someone who teaches something I don't believe in. So they'd refuse. So they'd end up going to jail. So the earliest freedom fighters in America, some of the, they're not the only ones, but some of the greatest, most staunch freedom fighters in the early parts of America and all were still colonies were Baptists. And uh, so, uh, for example, on his way to the meeting where he heard where John uh, Patrick Henry gave that famous speech, giving the earlier death. On his way there, he had stopped. He's going through Virginia, and uh, and he stopped and he heard uh, saw a bunch of people gathered around a, a jail, and he said, "What are these people?" He asked questions, and their pastor was in jail. He was preaching through the bars, and people were gathered together <laughs> to hear his sermon through, through through the through the jail bars. So that was a common thing, and uh, now as the as the the, 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 the the Declaration of Independence was made eventually. Uh, God was bringing all these people together to create an environment for liberty. That's, that's what I believe his goal was. And everybody wants liberty, but as has already been seen in the early colonies, they wanted liberty for themselves, but often they would not give it to somebody else who was of a different belief. And, and that's, what, that's what each group tried to get away from, but yet they found themselves doing the same thing. Uh, and by the way, that's what we got to be careful about here in, in re, 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 re inhabiting the Republic. We're going to want people who have, who are giving delegated powers. If we're not careful, if we don't restrain ourselves and discipline ourselves, we're going to want to use that power beyond the limits that are set by the Constitution. It's a constant battle. Just like I grew up in a family of nine kids. <coughs> Mom and dad would go off someplace, maybe have a date, so they'd put the oldest person in charge. And, uh, oh man, let me tell you, I was like the third of the youngest. I had nine kids, I was third of the youngest. And I hated it when mom and dad were gone because my older brothers, they loved it. Oh boy, I'm in charge now. <laughs> and they would love to exercise power. They loved to use that belt and they loved to, you know, lock us up in rooms and so forth. They, they loved to exercise in power. So we got to be careful about that. It's human nature to want to control. Uh, your art, not only your own lives, but then go beyond that and control others. So, anyway, there's one quick story I want to tell, um, and uh, I know that, so we'll scroll down and let me see if I find something else I want to do. Um, there's so much history, I don't want to give too much because a lot of it is uh, about the religious nature of, of things, and there, there's some de facto history that's being taught. Uh, that's good right there, just enough to remind me. Um, yeah, I, I probably better not go there. Um, let me give you a story that's very, very important. I told it briefly in a, in a smaller meeting once before. Um, James Madison was a delegate to the Continental Congress that was working on uh, the Constitution. As you know, James Madison is called the father of our Constitution. 
he didn't write it, Governor Morse wrote a lot of it, but James Madison put it together. He kind of made it, put it in order, he kind of organized it. And, uh, but he was, uh, he was running, he's up for re-election. Uh, the delegates were up for re-election. And uh, there's a, a vast movement, and Virginia was a fast growing, one of the fastest growing colonies. Virginia and North Carolina are growing very fast, but especially Virginia. And uh, he, uh, his campaign manager told him one day, he says, Mr. Madison, if you're not careful, this guy Barber, your opponent, he's going to win. I know you're, you've got this constitution, and, uh, and you've, you've, you've put a lot of work into it, but if you're not careful, you're going to lose the, your re-election bid to be a delegate. And Madison says, why? Why is Barber so? By the way, Barber was against ratifying the constitution. James Madison, of course, was for it, but Barber was against it. He didn't want it. He's an ad strong anti-federalist. He didn't want a big federal government that's exercising power over the states. And that's what they thought the Constitution would do. And so, but James Madison knew he, that's not what he had in mind. And, and of course, there were the Bill of Rights, as you know, later was, was, was added to make sure that doesn't happen, or at least it was designed to make sure that doesn't happen. But uh, so he asked his campaign manager, well, what am I going to do? What do I have to do? What, what do you hear? What do you know out there that I don't know? He says, you're forgetting about a very large, the fastest growing group in all of Virginia is the Baptists. And, and James Madison said, and by the way, James Madison was not a Baptist. He said, he said really? And, uh, and his campaign manager said, yes, sir. He said, well, who, what do I do about that? I don't know many. I, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't go in their circles. Do they have a leader? He says they're very independent, but they do meet. And there's one, one Baptist pastor, particular Baptist pastor, who's, who's pretty much got the ear. A lot of people, they all respect him. They're still independent, but they respect him greatly. His name is John Leland. You need to go see him and talk to him. So. James Madison, he asked around, and uh, he found out where, where John Leland lived, and he rode by horseback, rode out to John Leland's farm, and uh, knocked on the door, and uh, Mrs. Leland came to the door, and Mr. Madison said, uh, Mrs. Leland, I am James Madison. I'm looking for your husband, John Leland. Do you know where I can find him? She said, yes, sir, uh, except I don't think you want to find him. Uh, he, he doesn't really want to be bothered. He's out praying in the in a certain oak stand, a place where he always goes to pray and, and, uh, and talk with God and read his Bible. And James Madison, well, ma'am, I surely respect that, but I've got an issue that's very, very important for, for our country, and I need to talk to him. Would you tell me where that oak stand is? She said, sure. She gave directions. He went there, found John Leland. To make a long story short, they talked. And he said, uh, John, oh, by the way, the barber had the support of the Baptists, by the way. The Baptists were not for ratifying the Constitution either. And so James Madison said, look, I am trying to establish, we, we have got a frail country here, We're just a bunch of scattered, uh, I mean, we've got the Articles of the Confederation, but we need a stronger government to protect the Union of the States. And, uh, and I think this will do the job. Why are you guys against it? He says, don't you know? Don't you know our history? It doesn't matter where we go, we're always being persecuted. If it's not in this state by this group, it's in this state by another group. Uh, even here in Virginia, our, uh, I've been in jail myself. And uh, so, anyway, he explained to James Madison, he says, and he said, does a man have a right to believe according to his conscience? And James Madison, yes, yes, I believe that. He says, well, there's nothing in the Constitution to protect that. And if you're going to make these state laws national, we're in trouble. So there's no way we're going to support that. <laughs> and James Madison, I get you. He says, well, let me ask you something. If I, I believe we, we're already in the ratification <coughs> process. We can't make any amendments now. But if I give you my word that the First Amendment we make will be to guarantee your liberty, then will you support it? Jane, uh, John Leland thought about that. He says, he says, well, after talking to you for these minutes, I believe you to be, be a man of honor. I will trust you. I will trust you to keep your word. If you'll give us that, we'll support it. So James Madison secured the, 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 the support of the Baptists in Virginia. 
James Madison was reelected, and we got our Constitution. Now, why I say I'm not pushing Baptists, by the way. If you know me, you know I'm not doing that at all. Uh, I just I push the Bible. That's about it. Um, uh, most Baptist churches I wouldn't bother going to myself. I pastor one, but I wouldn't go to most of them. Because uh, like everything else, everything deteriorates, things get away from what they're, they're supposed to be. Um, so, but, but I tell you, the history back then, people had faith in the Bible and God's Word, and they were taking stands on different things. They dif disagreed about things, but that's who we the people are. We the people are people who come from different backgrounds, have different beliefs, have freedom of conscience to believe in God or not to believe in God. And if you do believe in God, believe in what, however you, you feel is right to believe about Him. If you believe, want to believe in the, the Bible, fine. If you want to believe in a uh, certain interpretation of the Bible, fine. You have that liberty. And, uh, and I will back up anybody's, I will support anybody's right to believe what they believe is right. James Madison made a statement one time. He said, he said religion is the duty we owe our Creator and the manager of discharging him. The manner of discharging So it's up to you to decide what your duty is, if you even think you have a duty. You have that liberty to do so. And uh, so I want to give you that history. We the people are composed of a bunch of different people who have come together and we've decided to grant to, to, to recognize the <coughs> rights of each other. If we're created by God, I have been, I'm 56 years old, I've never one time felt forced by God to do anything. He's never twisted my heart, made me do anything, He's never made me believe anything. I read my Bible because I want to. I don't have any making me do it. And uh, as an adult, once I left home, as a child, I didn't have the choice. Dad made me go to church, made me read the Bible. We had a Bible rule at our house, no Bible, no breakfast. And we had to read our Bibles every day before eating breakfast. And uh, <clears throat> But when I became, I got on my own and left home, I was free to do what I wanted to. But by then, I was already convinced that the Bible was right. And I was convinced most churches were wrong. <laughs> so I just kept on reading my Bible. So, but anyway, but the, the point is, everybody has the right to do that or not do that. It's your right. It's your freedom. And that's what our country is about. It's not about, you don't want it. That's why the First Amendment, you should know that well. That Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. To establish means to say, this is the way it is. They're going to make no law. Nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So they're not, going to, they're not supposed to make any law that says you cannot worship God the way you think you should be able to. Say, now, what happens, and what's happened in America, I'll take a minute just to talk about this briefly, and then I'll open up for questions. What's happened is we've got a bunch of lawyers who do not understand, or maybe they do understand, and they don't like what they understand, and they're trying to undo and take apart the religious liberty and the, the blessings of God on our nation. And they're trying to take God out of our nation, out of our government. And uh, I've got some quotes I'll read to you in a little bit. Um, maybe I'll do that before I take questions, because it might answer some questions before you ask them. Yeah, let me read you some quotes. I'll start off with one from James Madison, the founder of our Constitution, or the father of our Constitution. Here's what he said. I don't know the date that he said it, but he said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of all of our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. That's what he was counting on, that people would not murder each other. They would not lie. They would discipline themselves to not do things to each other that violates the rights that we have that come from our Creator, as expressed in the Ten Commandments. Now, Benjamin Franklin, oh, he's a guy everybody loves, everybody loves to say. He was a deist. He didn't much believe in God much. Well, you ought to read his gravestone. Anyway, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become more corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. That to me is a perfect telling quote of what's going on in America. Don't we have lots of masters? We got people spying on you, cameras everywhere, seeing how fast you travel. 
Now they're thinking about deciding how to tax how many miles you travel in your car. You know why, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, in my opinion, you know why all this stuff has come upon us? You know why all this de facto stuff has come upon us? Because we've gotten away from the principles of liberty. It's not because we've become more religious. I think America is more religious than it's ever been. But it's, it's like there's no compass anymore. I mean, what they what they say about California? Anybody can start a religion in California. <laughs> you can start it. You can make up for religion in, in a few minutes, and pretty soon have 50 followers on Facebook. You can start a religion and have a have 150 followers or so in just a few hours' time. It's just unbelievable. We've lost our compass. Uh, here's a quote from George Mason. He's the author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Write a good article. <laughs> He says that religion or the duty we owe our Creator, he got this from uh, James Madison or John Adams, that religion or the duty, see, we, we define religion differently. To us, it's an institution. To them, it was the duty, let me finish the quote, the duty which we owe our Creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion, that is their duty that they believe they owe their creator, according to the dictates of conscience, and that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity toward each other. So if you disagree with someone on some doctrine, let them have their beliefs. Debate if they're willing to, but if they don't want to debate, leave them alone. If they say I'm not interested, okay, respect that. I'm one of these guys, I go, almost every week I go knock on doors, strangers, you know, to tell them about the Lord, about the Bible and so forth, try to get them to know how they can know for sure, based on God's word that when they die they go to heaven, instead of playing the Russian roulette game and risking heaven, hell, you know, for all eternity because of however they were raised, wherever they were born. And uh, so I like doing that, but I quite often get people say, not interested, so what do I do? Thanks, have a nice day. I go on. Why? They have a right to not be interested. I don't have the right to force what I believe on them. I have the right to exercise and ask. But if they say no, the answer is no, and I move on. I have no responsibility towards them except at least try. So, you see, that's what we need. We need to all practice forbearance with one another, patience, and the rights <coughs> they have, but not allow anybody and not any religious organization, especially to gain such control, they begin to legislate, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. So, how many know about Ron Paul? How many know about Ron Paul? Woo! See, <laughs> He's you know, the man! You know, what really upsets me is so many people in what, what I call the religious right, I hate that term, but anyway, so many people in the religious right, they don't like Ron Paul. Because it's, oh, he's for prostitution, he's for this. <laughs> he's for drugs. He's for the government not being involved in those things. That's what he's, he's about. Yeah. He is a true Christian man who believes, he has strong beliefs, but he doesn't believe in forcing them on anybody else. And that, we need more people like that. And uh, so, we need some atheists <laughs> to believe that we have the right to believe in God. we got atheists trying to control our country, so you can't do this, can't do that, you got to take this Take this off the federal buildings. Take this off the pledge and out of the pledge. And take you know, they, they're not practicing forbearance either. So anyway, um, all right, I'm done with that. Anybody have any questions so far? No, I'm gonna. I should have bought some armor tonight. Yes. <laughs> the, <laughs> so that's one interesting point that uh, basically the news media pound the airwaves every day about the separation of the yes. United state. Yeah, I heard that statement already crazy. tonight. I heard it before the meeting. And I mean, what I'm asking you to do is explain to everyone what that. Yes, what I started to, and I, I forgot. Thank you, David. Um, yes, thank you. The, the the term separation of church and state is nowhere in the Constitution, not in the Declaration, it's not anywhere in our founding documents. It was in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist, Danbury, I think Danbury, Connecticut. Um, the Danbury Baptist is a, is a group of people who formed a church there. And he wrote to them, thanking them for some things. 
And letting them know, because as I just told you, as John Lagan was very concerned, many of the Baptists were concerned about our government. And he wrote them and said, uh, this is after the First Amendment was being proposed, he, and he has explained to them that this would erect, in a sense, it would erect a wall of separation between church and state. And what he meant was, it's a wall where Congress is prohibiting from writing any law that, uh, that prohibits the free exercise. That's a wall. So the only thing that the First Amendment prohibits is two things. Congress cannot establish a religion, and they can't prohibit the free exercise thereof. So that means if you want to pray, you have a right to pray. They can't pass a law, they can't. But what's happened, they've taken that phrase, separation of church and state, and their people are capitalizing on that, on the ignorance of the people, and saying, oh, we've got to have separation of church and state. No, you just need to have separation of the power of one over the other. But both can influence, can try to influence if they want to. If a government agent, if, a, if someone from the government wants to come to, to, to the church I pastor and say, you know what, I, you know, you need to, uh, you need to, uh, you got some grass over here, it's a little too long, some weeds are growing up high, uh, you need to cut that. If they were, I would tell them, no, that's an experiment. I'm growing weeds because I want, I want fiber. This, this dirt here is like clay and ter I'm growing weeds on purpose because they grow fast, so I can cut it down. And uh, until it's in the soil, I'll deal with, and hopefully it'll produce more seeds, uh, seeds that'll grow more weeds, and pretty soon, in about two years, I'm going to have some very good soil. And then I'll make sure that the seeds are all sprouted and killed off, and they don't produce any more seeds. And then I'm going to have me some good ground. Now, there's, if he wants to influence and say, give a recommendation, he's welcome to give a recommendation, but he has no power to say what we can or cannot do. And I also have the right to go, uh, to, to go and make a suggestion to, to uh, I have the right to suggest to our governor, hey, Governor Eversher, I'd like to suggest that you read the Bible every day. But I have no right to say, you have to read your Bible every day or we're going to vote you out. You don't have a right to do that. We can suggest, we can influence one another, but there's a, definitely a wall of power over each other. There are separate jurisdictions. Jesus made that clear, and he said, Render, and people came to him, they wanted to trick him. Hey, Jesus, uh, I've got this. Uh, is, sh sh is it right to pay taxes unto Caesar? And Jesus said, bring me a coin. They brought him a coin. And he said, whose inscription is on that coin? Or whose superscription is on that? Now, whose image is over the, whose raised image is, is that? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Separate jurisdictions. If Caesar, if, if the United States wants to print money, they can print money. See? And if they say that's ours, you're going to come back to us, well, okay, give it to them. But give to God what's God's. That's your labor, your soul, your mind, your heart, <laughs> if you're wise. But, but anyway, uh, and, anything, and anything you produce that becomes yours, uh, you can do that if you want to, but you don't have to, you're free to. So anyway, a separation, I hope I explained that, separation of church and state is to where the church does not dictate to the government, and the government does not dictate to the state. Yes, the Church of England is the best example, I that's what you're talking about. Yes, Church of England, the king said, hey, I'm king, I'll do it. He was, he was the king of the land, temporal power, but also he was the head of the church. So, you know, that's why Baptists had to get out of there, because they were being burned at the state for but now it's exactly the opposite. We have a president, king, whatever you want to call it, and if there is no religion, right? Yeah. Now it's they're not trying to get it all out anytime, unless right. unless it's what you want. A lot of people don't understand that the first thing that Congress did after they rat <coughs> after the ratification of the, or maybe yeah, after the ratification of the uh, uh, the, the meeting where they rat the, the, declared the Constitution ratified, the first thing they did is they went to a chapel and had prayer service. <laughs> That's the first thing they did. So uh, our history is full of. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, even later on, the White House, not White House, the Capitol Hill, but the Capitol building was used, at least out, was used for church services quite often. Um, there, there's some really good stuff uh, uh, out there available if you dig. Yes, Jim. The, the, uh, those that were. Report that say, for instance, 
there's arguments whether the, the, that it's Moses with the Ten Commandments on the top of the Supreme Court building. They say, no, it's not. They say, you know, it's somebody else, and there's all these wise men. Or the Ten Commandments being on the door, or all those things, uh, religious things on government buildings, which shows a suggestion to government as you were saying before, an influence of, call it art or whatever, it shows that the history of government was influenced by Christianity. Now also, it's also influenced by uh, others, hence the design of Washington, D.C., and some of the various Masonic design, yes. Masonic designs right on our money and all that stuff. So it's influenced both by we stand up. And it's also influenced by Stand up, please. Can't see me? Nope. Oh, we have been blocked. You're hiding behind mine. You're hiding. You might need to stand on the chair again. I was kidding. Okay. What I was saying is, is or the question was. Okay. Yeah, you stand in one place, it's easier on me, too. <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. The, 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 the arguments that you hear out there is those that have influenced um, or, or, or want to take down the Ten Commandments, and they did uh, from that judge in I forget, whatever state, and they, they dragged him out of the courthouse in Alabama. Uh, and there's, there's, you know, there's Christian or believing uh, symbology over many, many government buildings all over this country, which certainly shows an influence or a suggestion. Um, and probably, you know, it wasn't the government that designed those buildings. They hired architects or whatever, and they did it. So that's an influence of the people that put those symbologies on, on, on buildings. And today, um, non-believers, and every time it seems to be an atheist, going to the courts and so forth, saying those need to come off because of this separation of church and state. So if there's an obvious influence or suggestion or whatever of our history of, of Christianity on government buildings. There's also the obvious influence of um, another ideology or Illuminati or, or Mason, Freemasonry and all that stuff. <coughs> look on our money, the all-seeing eye and all that stuff, that is not an influence of Christianity, but something else. The design of Washington, D.C., if, if you look at it, it's hard to ignore the streets were designed as a, as a goat head or an upside-down pentagram and stuff. So there's both influences of what he would think, you know, as a, as a pastor or preacher, as, as a good, and probably a good argument if you got an upside down goat head that they they the, the believers of that would say that's worshiping Lucifer. So so both Well what I was gonna ask that that's a good idea, but I was gonna ask Pastor Coleman in his you know discussion here, how do you how do you uh, answer the question of those that are trying to remove those things, these things, but not these things from government buildings? Well, I would just say this, um, that the, the people's right to exercise their religion and, and, and the history that, of which our nation was founded on and the principles of the majority of the people were rooted in Christianity. And so they have a right to, to express that in their uh, governmental buildings and and, uh, and the structure, I mean, the, our laws. I mean, when we go through the Constitution, or the, when we get to the Bill of Rights, you can be amazed where those come from. Um, uh, the principles of, of that, those in the Constitution are just so clearly come from the Bible. So people are so Bible literate back then that it was, that's, it was common knowledge. And that's really the root of, of common law. Uh, it was so common, commonly known. So what I would say to those people is, is they, they have likewise must respect you know, our history, must respect who, who the, our founders were, and we are, those, we are the posterity of those people. And uh, so they don't have a right to undo history. And uh, why is it they always just attack Christianity? 
uh, you're pointing out, I don't, haven't heard anybody attacking, oh, we need to bulldoze Washington, D.C. because it's Masonic street turn, Masonic symbol. You know, uh, we're not doing that. Uh, there's mythological characters also on government buildings, and that's paganism. But I don't care about that. It don't bother me at all. <laughs> so the only people that are bothered seem to be bothered by the, by the, the biblical things, the Christian things. And, uh, and they don't have the right to force their way on us. Um, so it's, it's, just a, it's just a, we've got an atmosphere in this country and a media that backs up because they're all part of, it's not that, see, I, I don't think it's just about, you know, them against us. I don't think it's that. I think there's people manipulating that. And they're using, they, they're glad to create any kind of controversy. They don't care what the controversy is. It could be, you know, I'm against Disney, you know. Uh, this, this ban all cartoons, is bad for the kids. Anything to create controversy to keep us where the government can compro, compro, propose a solution so they maintain their power. So, so anyway, uh, I hope that answered your question. One other thing I want to say. And, uh, oh. This is a copy of what the first Bible printed in English in America looked like. This Bible was printed by the U.S. Congress in 1782. In the records, it says that this Bible was, quote, a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of our schools, end quote. So the first Bible printed in America in English was printed by Congress for the use of our schools. It's worse than that. In the front of the cover, it says that Congress resolved the United States and Congress assembled recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. So the first Bible printed in English in America was done by the guys who signed the documents, endorsed by Congress, and done for the use of schools. And we're going to be told that they don't want any kind of religion and education. They don't want voluntary prayer. No, it doesn't make sense. This document by itself is fairly significant. But in 1830, Congress commissioned these four paintings over here to recapture what the official record said was the Christian history of the United States. So in these four paintings, you have really a span of several hundred years. If I take you through them chronologically, the first is back there, Columbus, landing in the Western world in 1492. Uh, they got out, they knelt down, they had a prayer service. You see the cross they have. They named the land where they had landed San Salvador, meaning Holy Savior, which tells you something of the thinking that was going on then. You come back over my shoulder here. This is the baptism of Pocahontas in Jamestown, and this was in 1613. Uh, over here, the fourth painting is 1620. This is the embarkation of the pilgrims coming to America. You see them gathered around the Bible there. You see the prayer meeting they're having. Now, if you just take those four paintings right there, those four paintings in this great secular hall of government, those four paintings represent two prayer meetings of Bible study and baptism, which is not bad for a secular building. As a matter of fact, you're standing in what, in 1857, was the largest church in the United States. It's the U.S. Capitol. Back on December the 4th of 1800, uh, members of Congress, members of the Senate, Thomas Jefferson was over the Senate, you had John Trumbull over the House, they decided that on Sundays we would turn, turn the Capitol building into a church building. And starting on Sunday, we started having services in the Capitol. Now, six weeks after that, Thomas Jefferson became President of the United States. But for his eight years as President, he went to church here at the U.S. Capitol listen to the sermons here at the Capitol, and being commander-in-chief, he decided he could help the worship here at the Capitol. He ordered the Marine Corps band to come play the worship services at the Capitol. Now, that'd be kind of cool having the Marine Corps band as your worship band, you know, church. That church went for the better part of a century, and by 1857, there were 2,000 people a week that went to church in the Hall of the House of Representatives. In addition to that, there were four other churches that met at the Capitol. First Congregational, was this was their church home, as was First Presbyterian, as was Capitol Hill Presbyterian. Churches met here. There was nothing secular or seen to be secular about this building until the last 30, 40, 50 years. I'm revived. I feel different. I feel that I'll go home and know how to pray. Last night I walked around the... Mm. So that's a little bit of interesting history. Uh, let me say one other thing that I... That I uh, that I struggle with, or that to me it's an oxymoron, or shows the shows the lack of, of thinking in some people's minds. Um, let me ask you a question: What religion is this? This is my New Testament. Can you call this a religion? Is it uh, is it is this a Catholic book? 
Is it a Methodist book? Nope. Is it a Presbyterian book? Yes. I can't That's tell. All. Is it, huh? None at all. So, no, it's, it's not even. This was before any of those got started. You know, I can, I, I'm teaching on the history of church religion right now in my church on Wednesday nights, and I've been going through the history of the Protestant Reformation, and I know the dates of when most of those that I just named got started. They had to start, and this was before that. So, so it's, it, this is not a religion. It's a book that people believe or don't believe. They're free to believe or not to believe it, but it's not a religion. So religion is the duty... For example, Catholics think that their duty to God is to do this, 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 and Methodists think their duty is, is something different. And so they'll disagree. But they ought to be free to believe whatever they think is right. Both of them, sometimes one more than the other. <laughs> in fact, neither of them very much, <laughs> in my opinion, use this a whole lot. But they, they claim it as the basis, what they believe. And they have the right to do so. You have the right to make whatever claim you want to. But you've got to be willing to back it up. And, uh, but, but you don't force the one thing on, on anybody. That's the main thing. I, mean, good, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what your background is. I will be your staunchest supporter of your right to have freedom of... Baptists were known for one big thing during the early days, and that is soul liberty. They are the champions of soul liberty. God made you a unique soul. You have liberty, freedom to do. Uh, I like the word soul, freedom better. You have the freedom to do whatever you want to do. Just don't infringe on somebody else's freedom. And that's what we believe. That's what Cain did. To, Cain infringed on Abel's liberty, didn't he? Killed him. Cain disagreed. He didn't like it that God respected Abel's sacrifice and not his. Well, if you're going to sacrifice to God, you better find out how he wants it done. He's the boss. And Cain decided his own thing, and he got mad at Abel because Abel's was the good guy, and you're making me look bad. I'm going to get even with you, and he killed him. Why? Because he didn't give his own brother liberty. And uh, Abel's giving him liberty, had a, had a lamb tied to his door. And God said, hey, sin, there's a sin offering. There's, it's right there tied to your door. If you do well, sin lieth at the door. It's right there. Your brother has thought about you. But anyway, okay. <laughs> Liberty is such a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. And we need to extend it to everybody. Any other questions? Yes, Bill. No, sorry. A coming in question. Uh, okay. Going back to what was. Uh, going back to what you were saying about um, a uh, systematic attack on Christianity, I think it's more <coughs> a systematic attack simply to remove God from government because if we, if they are successful in removing God from government and God is the source of our rights, with, if there's no God in go government, then who is the source of the rights? And I think they would have us believe that the source of rights would be from the, the government, and thus, then they control our rights. Um, that's just a comment that I had to, wanted to make. I had a question that I'm curious as to where um, you're getting your uh, et etymology on the uh, Constitution. Uh, I've heard some things uh, a while back. Um, you have the word constitutor, you have constitution, constitute. And um, constitutor is um, one who sta stands in for somebody else, else in the in the matter of a debt. Um, and um, I, I'm looking at I'm seeing constitution is a little different than what you're saying, and, and I, I guess that's what I'm asking is um, where is where are you getting your et etymology from? Oh, if you're, you're standing, breaking it down to one small part of it. The root word stiff is where you get the sand. And you just mentioned it in your definition. Well, it stands in for somebody. Yes, that's what the, you said. So how, how you use the word will create different variations, but the root word is still stand. And if you're standing for somebody, that means they're on the same side, they're together. That's why you have the con and the, and the stiff still there. 
And then the or is just that's that person. He's the constitutor. Well, the thing that I'm looking at that says that, that it comes from the word uh, constitutus from the, from the Latin. Well, yeah, that's not a root word. That's a Latin word, but, it, but you can break that down. That's what I did. I broke it down all the way to its root. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't apparently go all the way down. OK? Um, it's a good question, though, and good comment. Uh, I would add something to your comment in that, um, and, and you're right on, in your comment that if the government can get God out of everything, they can, they can take away the principle of where our rights come from. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that that is a stage that they'll go through uh, to accomplish some things, but I think their real goal uh, is eventually replace God with a different God. So you get rid of one first, and that's step one. And then you bring in a new one. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a false one. So you think they bring them a new one, or they would be the replacement of? Well, I think the goal is, and my understanding is comes from the Bible that foretells the future, that there will be an antichrist who's going to take, who's going to get people to believe that he is God. Mm -hmm. So eventually, they're, they're going to want, eventually the goal is Satan is, from the beginning wanted to take the place of God. So he's the one behind everything. So 